without further ado, I would love it if everyone could give me a loud round of applause for Lacey. We good? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for inviting us, Chris, to come and talk at your museum. Um, we are one of 26 sites in Minnesota, so we are under the umbrella of the Minnesota Historical Society. We are tucked away in a small community called Little Falls, Minnesota. It's tucked along the Mississippi. Um, so tonight, I am going to be talking to you about the crime of the century, the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. And it is an honor to be here to talk about one of the most notorious cases of the 20th century. I'm going to give you a pretty big trigger warning with this presentation. I will talk about infant death pretty graphically. Um, it's unavoidable in this presentation because it pertains to the case so much. So before we dive into the details of this case, I'm going to briefly talk about the sociological implications of the United States during the 1920s and 30s. Um, kidnapping became an epidemic during this time. Uh, when Charles Lindbergh, the year that Charles Lindbergh Jr. was kidnapped, over 3,000 kidnappings had been reported. Um, those statistics are a little bit iffy because we don't really know for sure, um, but that is what the estimation currently is. So in 1929, the stock market crash that led to the Great Depression created a chasm between the rich and the poor that left many Americans desperate for money and looking for work. Between 1929 and 1933, Unemployment in the United States jumped from 3.2% to 24.9%, almost a quarter of the official labor force. And in the end of 1933, the, the, the prohibition ended, um, or the complete ban of and consumption of alcohol. Um, it left bootleggers and rum runners out of work as well. And this desperation led to an uptick of violent crime during this era. Um, so the Lindbergh baby kidnapping was, no, was not really shocking to the United States as kidnappings have been reported all over. Um, this is also the era where we see a major immersion of the um, gangs um, in major cities like Chicago, New York. Um, so kidnapping became an easy way for people to make money. Um, the, the kidnapping and murder of Charlie Jr. pushed the nation to collectively grieve over the baby of a national hero. Uh, it also created an urgency for change and harsher punishment for these crimes. On May 21st, 1927, a single engine plane landed at Labergé Airport just outside of Paris. Charles Augustus Lindbergh stepped out to greet 150,000 people as he had just been the first pilot to complete a transatlantic trans flight from New York to Paris. Charles Lindbergh became an instant celebrity. In 1929, Charles met Anne Morrow, the daughter of Dwight Morrow, who happened to be the ambassador of Mexico at the time. Anne Morrow was a recent graduate of Smith College, where she major majored in English literature and creative writing. After a short courtship, courtship of approximately two dates, the couple quietly wed in May of 1929. Their first child, child Charles Jr., was born on Anne's 24th birthday, June 22nd, 1930. The weekend before the kidnapping, Charles Jr. had a slight cold. Normally, the family would have returned to Next Day Hill in Inglewood, New Jersey. Next Day Hill was the family home of the Moros. Anne and Charles stayed at Next Day Hill during the construction of their family home in Hopewell, New Jersey. On Sunday, the family decided to stay an extra night because the weather was not favorable. And on Tuesday, Charles Jr. was still ill, so the family decided to return to Inglewood on Wednesday. I have put up a map of New Jersey just for reference. Um, so the homes were a few hours apart. Um, and normal, the family had very predictable schedules during this time. They would always spend their weekends at their new home and then return to the Moros. At 7.30 on March 1st, 1932, Charlie Jr. was put to bed. Anne returned to the library, and the nurse checked on Charlie Jr. around 8 p.m. Charles Lindbergh returned to the home around 8.30 p.m., and the couple enjoyed a quiet dinner together. Around 9 p.m., Charles had reported, reported hearing a sharp noise that he described as wood breaking coming from the kitchen, um, and he assumed it was just the weather. Um, around 10 p.m., when the nurse went to check on the baby, Charlie Jr. was gone from his crib. Charles Lindbergh did an initial search of the premises that revealed a ransom note on the windowsill. Um, the ransom note reads, Dear Sir, have 50,000 ready. 
$25,000 in $20 bills, $15,000 in $10 bills, and $10,000 in $5 bills. After two to four days, we'll inform you where to deliver the money. We warn you for the making anything public or notify the police, the child is in good care. Um, indication for all three letters are signature and three holds. Um, so if you look at the bottom of the ransom letter, those three circles were going to be the signature of the kidnappers. Um, the Lindberghs received multiple people during this time, multiple notes who claimed to have the Lindbergh baby. And this is how the Lindberghs would know that these were the actual kidnappers. Um, after the initial police call to the local Hopewell PD, the New Jersey State Police were immediately notified and assumed charge of the investigation. By the early hours of, of March 2nd, 1932, the whole world knew about the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. I have pulled different news bulletins from around the world to demonstrate just this massive urgency to find the Lindbergh baby came from the United States and overseas as well. Um, and then more, oh, sorry. So um, when the police came, the um, things that were found on site were two sections of the ladder that had been used to reach uh, the second story window. One of the sections was broken, indicating that the ladder broke during the ascent or the descent of the kidnapper. Um, there was no bloodstains nor fingerprints at the crime scene, which baffled police immediately. Um, there were traces of mud on the floor. There was a 3 4 inch chisel found and two sets of muddy footprints under the nursery window. On March 6, the Lindbergh family received the second ransom note. The ransom demand was increased to 70000 A police conference was then called by the governor um, at Trenton, New Jersey, which was attended by prosecuting officials, police authorities, and government representatives. Various theories and policies of procedures were discussed. Um, private investigators were also employed by um, Lindbergh's attorney, Henry Breckenridge, which there is a photo of him up. And Dr. John Condon was chosen by both Charles Lindbergh and the abductor to act as an intermediary between the kidnapper and the Lindbergh family. After a series of communications, 50,000 in gold certificates were paid by the Lindbergh family to the abductor. Lindbergh drove Condon to the cemetery with the ransom money. Condon met with the abductor and was able to provide the police with a description. The, the police produced a sketch that was circulated nationally. This is the sketch here. They referred to him as Cemetery John. So when initially asked by Condon what his name, won or what his name was or what we should call him, um, he just replied with John. So then he was dubbed Cemetery John. The Lindbergh family wanted proof of the child's identity and with the seventh ransom note, the kidnapper agreed to produce a token. A sleep suit was given to Congdon that was later identified le by Lindbergh as belonging to Charlie Jr. Um, other interested parties contacted the Lindberghs in offer of assistance. Morris or Mickey Rosner was a small time real estate dealer who claimed he was an underworld emissary. When we talk about the underworld, we talk about gangs um, that were prominent in major cities because the police thought that they might have had something to do with the kidnapping. Rosner claimed that Abby Wagner was responsible for the kidnapping. Wagner had been involved with high profile kidnappings of Broadway racketeers. Um, Rosner was not able to provide the police with any significant information about the kidnapping, um, but did offer the Lindberghs a piece of advice. He said, it is far more important to get their baby back and pay the price rather than throw the child at the mercy of the three police departments who were fighting for glory. Rosner would turn out to be right about competing investigations, which we will discuss a little bit later in the presentation. Lindbergh reached out to mobster Frank Costello for his ties to the mafia. Costello sent his men to gather information and reported back to Henry Breckenridge that he did not believe that the underworld had anything to do with the, the kidnapping of Charlie Jr. Costello believed that the baby was already dead and instructed Lindbergh not to pay the ransom. More famously, Al Capone reached out to the Lindbergh family. He offered $10,000 as a reward and offered assistance under the condition that he would be released from prison. He did not, the Lindberghs did not engage with Al Capone. He remained in prison. 
On May 12, 1932, 72 days after the kidnapping, the corpse of a small child was discovered in the woods surrounding the Lindbergh estate and a shallow grave. The body was badly decomposed and some of the body members were missing. An initial review of the body suggested that Charles Jr. had died from blunt force trauma, suffering three fractures to his skull. The body was positively identified by Charles Lindbergh to be his son's. Following the murder, a, photography, a photographer broke into the morgue and snapped a picture of the corpse. Copies of the image were distributed for $5. Um, out of respect of Charlie Jr., we will not be showing that photo. Um, the photos were so grotesque that no newspaper would dare run it, but the prints ended up in many speakeasies um, throughout the nation. Uh, speakeasies are unlicensed saloon that sold bootlegged alcohol during the Prohibition. Um, Charles Lindbergh then ordered the body of his son to be cremated immediately. Um, the crime scene was also heavily compromised by reporters. They were at every move in this case. They immediately surrounded the area where the body was discovered, eliminating any critical evidence that would have been there. The aftermath of, Char of the discovery of Charlie Jr. was devastation. The Lindberghs never stayed at their Hopewell estate again. Anne wrote, I feel strangely a sense of peace, not peace, but an end to a restlessness, a finality as though I were sleeping in a grave. Charles Lindbergh was on a ship in the middle of the ocean when he received the news. After Condon met Cemetery John and gave the ransom money to him, he told them Charlie Jr. was on a boat, so that's why he was out. Um, Anne wrote in her diary that after Charles received the news, he was focused on the bigger picture and insisted that they try to move on from this. One day after the discovery of the child's corpse, President Herbert Hoover directed that the Federal Bureau of Investigation should be at the disposal of the state of New Jersey. However, J. Edgar Hoover did not want to be at the disposal of NYPD or the New Jersey State Police because he thought that they were being used as errand boys. The police would come to them with information and then they would go to these federal agencies just to get the information and relay it back to the police. Um, they, the um, FBI would not further assist on the case unless they were specifically asked by Lindbergh or the New Jersey State Police. After internal conflicts between Herbert Hoover, the FBI, and the New Jersey State Police, the FBI ended up establishing its own investigation with hand-picked agents to follow up on every lead related to the Lindbergh case. The FBI would not share any information with the Lindbergh family or the New Jersey State Police. The lead investigator of the New Jersey State Police, Norman Schwarzkopf, was constantly criticized by the FBI, by President Hoover, and the media after the discovery of the baby's corpse. The Brooklyn Daily Eagle wrote that Schwarzkopf lacks anything indicating that he was qualified to adequately handle the greatest criminal investigation of modern history. Likewise, Senator Emerson Richards of New Jersey threatened to open a Senate investigation into the actions of the New Jersey State Police mishandling of the case. So the police had a lot of initial suspects. They firmly believed that this kidnapping was done by more than one person. Um, and it had to be somebody who was on the inside that knew the family's movements because during the week of the kidnapping, they were so sporadic. Um, so this is a list of their initial Suspects, Elise Waitley, um, who was a servant in the household. Betty Gao, she was the child's nurse. Oliver Waitley was the husband of Elise, and he was also a servant in the Lindbergh estate. And Violet Sharp. Violet was a friend of Betty Gao's and also a servant in the Lindbergh estate. Um, all suspects were initially cleared by police. Um, in 1933, Franklin D. Roosevelt was elected as president of the United States and almost immediately suspended the circulation of golden certificates. Gold certificates were used to pay the abductors. This aided the investigation immensely as banks were instructed to notify the FBI immediately if any gold certificates came through with matching serial numbers to the ransom bills. On September 18, 1934, a tip from a gas station attendant led police to the arrest of Bruno Houtman. One of the gold certificates with traceable serial numbers was used by Houtman to purchase 98 cents worth of gas. 
Suspicious of the gold certificate, the gas attendant wrote down the license number and turned it into the bank. When the bank received this gold certificate, they notified the FBI immediately. <coughs> Bruno Richard Hauptmann was an immigrant from Germany that fought in World War I as a machine gunner. He was wounded during service and returned to Commence after the war. Hauptmann attended a trade school for carpentry and machinery. After World War I, the economy was wounded pretty badly and work was very scarce. In March of 1918, he stole 300 marks in a silver watch. He then robbed a leather tanner in Commence and stole 200 marks, a gold watch, and a chain. Lastly, he stole food from two housewives. Um, Hauptmann was arrested and convicted of all three robberies and sentenced to five years in prison. In 1923, he was paroled and again arrested for selling stolen goods. Um, in November of 1923, he eluded police and boarded a ship to the United States. Shortly after he arrived, he met and married Anna Schofler in October of 1925 and soon after had a child. When the market crashed in October of 1929, Bruno, like so many Americans, were unable to find work and pretty desperate for money. Bruno then told his wife that he had a foolproof plan to make money off of the stock market. Hauptmann was arrested by police on November 19, 1934, and brought into police custody for questioning. A search of Hauptmann's home revealed $19,700 in gold certificates, all with traced serial numbers to the ransom money that was given by Lindbergh. Hauptmann denied his involvement with the kidnapping, and on September 26, he was charged with extortion. Days later, on October 8th, charges of kidnapping and murder were added. The trial of Bruno Richard Hauptmann began on January 3rd, 1935 in Flemington, New Jersey. 60,000 people, including reporters, novelists, movie stars, and society matrons flooded the small New Jersey town. The trial lasted five weeks, and the case built against him was largely circumstantial. Charles Lindbergh testified that he had recognized Hauptmann's voice from the cemetery when he dropped off Dr. Condon with the ransom money. During a police lineup, Condon was called to identify Hauptmann. Hauptmann was put in a lineup with four patrolmen and nine detectives, um, both from the NYPD and the New Jersey State Police, instead of jailed prisoners like they normally do. Special Agent Leon Toro of the FBI recalled Hauptmann looking like a midget who wandered into a Turkish bath next to a clean-shaven, six-foot, bright-eyed police officer. Condon could not positively identify Hauptmann in the lineup. A few days later, however, he claimed that Hauptmann was the man he met with at the cemetery. During his testimony, Condon also further asserted that Hauptmann was the man that he met with. Dr. Condon's telephone number and address were found scrawled on a door frame inside a closet in the Hauptmann's home. Handwriting analysis was done after an initial interview with Hauptmann. The handwriting specialist declared that he had many mental reservations that Hauptmann was the author. However, by the time of the trial, he identified Hauptmann as a writer after he examined more handwriting samples and also examined the handwriting in the home of Hauptmann. Norman Schwarzkopf of the New Jersey Police Department had previously hired expert Arthur Kohler of the United States Forest Service to come and examine the wood found at the crime scene. For two years, Kohler disassembled the ladder and identified the types of wood used and examined the tool marks on the ladder. He also looked at the pattern made by nail holes, for it appeared that likely some of the wood had been used before in indoor, in indoor construction, so it came from someone's home or garage. Kohler made trips to the Lindbergh and Hauptmann estates and to factories to trace some of the wood. From this report, the police were able to determine that the wood from rail 16 on the ladder matched the wood used in the flooring in Hauptmann's attic. Tool marks on the ladder matched tool marks owned by Hauptmann. We'll go into the evidence photos here. This is the marked bill that Hauptmann had turned in. That is his car. This is the handwriting analysis that was done on Hauptmann after he was arrested. A picture of his attic with a missing floorboard and um, the three fourth inch chisel found at the crime scene compared with another Hauptmann tool. 
um, and they determined that they were matching and came from the same set. And then the last picture here is of the handwriting that was found inside the doorway at Heltman's house that had Dr. Condon's um, name, address, and phone number listed. Okay, Heltman was defended by Edward J. Riley, a 52-year-old well-known defense attorney. He was dubbed the Bull of Brooklyn. Riley boasted that he had represented more than 2,000 defendants and claimed that he had acquitted most of them. Apparently, his luck ran out with the case against him, against Houtman, um, because his defense was very weak. Uh, Riley maintained his clients innocent and blamed the crime on Isidore Fish. Houtman and Fish were business partners in the fur business, um, but Fish returned to Germany uh, in 1933. It is the claim by the defense that Helpman told, said that he had left some of his belongings with Helpman before he returned to Germany, including the money found during the police search. Um, Fish died of tuberculosis in Germany in 1934. The police could not do anything with that information. The defense attempted the, to counter the handwriting analysis with uh, the testimony of John M. Trenley of East St. Louis. Trenley was an imitator who imitated other people's handwriting for a living um, to try and trick handwriting experts. Trenley also compared the ransom notes to Houtman's writing and declared that Houtman had not written any of them. The prosecution destroyed him on stand um, because he was not a cre credible witness or a credible testimony. The defense also objected to the testimony of Kohler, um, the head of the Department of U.S. Agriculture, by stating, there is no such animal known among men as an expert on wood. The objection was overruled, and the testimony of Kohler was the nail in the coffin for Helpman. Reportedly, Helpman asked his defense counsel, where are you getting these witnesses? They're killing me. On February 13, 1935, the jury found Helpman guilty and sentenced him to death. After losing an appeal and a granted 30-day extension by the governor of New Jersey, Haltman was electrocuted on April 3, 1936. As a result of the kidnapping and murder of Charles Lindbergh Jr., the Federal Kidnapping Act, or Lindbergh Law, was enacted on June 22, 1932. This would have been um, Charlie Jr.'s second birthday. Um, it's, the law made kidnapping across state lines a federal crime. The Lindbergh baby was found murdered less than four miles from his home, and there was no evidence that he had been transported across state lines. Had the Lindbergh law been in effect when Charlie was kidnapped, it would not have applied to this case. In fact, the bill that ultimately became the Lindbergh law was not introduced in the wake of this crime. It was not introduced by members of the New Jersey delegation that represented the Lindbergh family, and it was not, or it was not the state. Um, instead, it had been introduced three months earlier um, by Senator Roscoe Conkling Patterson of Missouri, Missouri and Representative John Joseph Cochran of St. Louis. Kidnappings were incredibly common in St. Louis and in Kansas City. As these cities were influenced by organized crime, the proximity of the Mississippi River made it easy to transport victims across state lines, thus created the urgency to enact a law like this. Because of the popularity and sensationalism of the Lindbergh case, the bill was unanimously passed and allowed the FBI and the U.S. Marshals to pursue kidnappers across state lines, overstepping local and state police. The case also ignited a wider call for harsher punishments of criminals. So we're going to talk briefly about the, the conspiracy theories surrounding this case because there are a variety of them. This case has never died. <laughs> It is continually brought up by historians, criminologists, judges. Um, this is probably one of the most well-studied cases in the United States. So from the beginning, as I stated the, before, the police firmly believed that more than one person was involved. The police also believed that someone who knew the family and their movements had to be, had to be in as well. The family was supposed to return to the Morrow estate in Inglewood after the weekend, but because of Charlie Jr.'s illness, they stayed. Um, 
One conspiracy is that one of the household staff was involved, particularly Violet Sharp. Um, she was a maid in the Morrow Estate in Inglewood, New Jersey. She came to Hopewell um, with Betty Gow. She was an English immigrant in her late 20s. Uh, early on, the police suspected that she had something to do with the kidnapping because she knew the intimate details of the Lindbergh schedule. Um, Sharp was also incredibly inconsistent with her alibi, and she appeared anxious and defensive to the police. After the police phoned her to tell her that she would be questioned again, Sharp committed suicide by cyanide. The police were able to clear Violet Sharp by locating the man she stated she was with that night, but lingering questions still remained. The conspiracy theory that seems to be the most popular is that Charles Lindbergh himself was, was involved with the abduction of his son. Um, Lloyd Gardner, Rutgers University historian, is probably the lead historian on this theory, so I will reference his. Um, Again, since the police believed that this had been committed by a group and someone had to, from the inside, had to be involved, the police did vigorous interrogations of all of the household staff. Uh, Charles Lindbergh also had a fascination with social Darwinism and eugenics. Lindbergh adhered to the racial superiority of Northern Europeans, particularly Germans and Scandinavians. According to Gardner, his desire to spread his healthy genes and his belief in eugenics reflected in his secret affairs with three German women in the 1950s. These affairs produced seven children besides the six he had with his wife, Anne Morrow. There is pretty good evidence to suggest that little Charlie dealt with health issues. The health and physical conditions were loud, uh, largely downplayed um, and hidden from the public and law enforcement during this time. Charlie Jr. appeared to have been afflicted with rickets disease. It's a severe vitamin D and calcium deficiency that will cause mental and physical developments. Um, it'll also cause muscle weakness. Charlie Jr. was bow-legged. He had hammer toes on his left foot, and he had a large cranium that was fused to his skull bones. Rickets is treated with aggressive vitamin therapy and a strict diet, and sometimes it can be treated with surgery. It is reported that from Charlie Jr.'s birth, he was on a very strict diet. According to Gardner, Charles Lindbergh's behavior during the investigation also warrants questioning. The aviator took charge of the investigation. He isolated household staff who may have had knowledge of his son's medical conditions um, from, from authorities, including J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI. Following a cursory autopsy, Charles demanded the body to be cremated before any other autopsies could be performed. Um, eliminating any critical evidence that may have been there. Gardner also throws into question the whereabouts of Lindbergh the night of the kidnapping. Lindbergh inadvertently missed a public speaking engagement in New York City, instead returning to the estate that night. It is important to note that these are just theories. They currently do not hold enough evidence to reopen the Lindbergh baby case. However, we have to recognize that these theories um, have a huge impact on the way that the case is studied and published today. The doubts of the outcome of this trial are not new. Immediately after the conviction of Hauptmann, First Lady Re uh, Eleanor Roosevelt stated, it seemed the verdict had been based entirely on circumstantial evidence. While not in sympathy with Hauptmann, I was a little perturbed at the thought of what might happen to any innocent person in a similar situation. The entire trial left me with a question in my mind, and I was certainly glad that I did not have to sit on that jury. Ninety years after the abduction and murder of Charles Lindbergh Jr., questions about the case are still left unanswered. The most important questions surrounding the guilt of Hauptmann concern of the handling of the case by the FBI and the New Jersey State Police, where there have been accusations of mishandling evidence and destroying fingerprints. Special Agent Leon Thoreau also reported that Hauptmann had been, beating, had been beaten while in police custody. Lastly, the credibility of Lindbergh and Dr. Condon as witnesses and the intense testimony of Kohler has baffled anyone who studied the case in the last 90 years. I again want to thank the Robert McCormick Museum for inviting me to speak on this. If you have any questions regarding this presentation, feel free to, to ask, otherwise reach out to the museum directly. <laughs>